Welcome to Full Rigor, a Florida true crime podcast. I'm your host, Karen Curtis. And on this episode, the peg or the raison d'etre is that there was a man who had long been considered a person of interest in the murder of a 21 year old South Florida woman. He's just been arrested after 38 long years. And using, no, not DNA, as you might think, but new fingerprint technology. You know, usually cold cases are solved through DNA, but this case got me thinking about fingerprints. And, you know, back in the day before DNA, police and law enforcement relied on fingerprints left at a scene to connect a suspect to a crime. Now, we all have fingerprints that are unique to us, even identical twins who share everything else have different fingerprints. And they share the same DNA. But when a suspect is committing a crime, they also produce extra oil from their fingertips. So it actually makes their prints even easier to isolate and lift. Little did they know. So, you know, wear gloves if you want to avoid that. But if a criminal doesn't wear gloves, then the fingerprint is going to be there. Because the fingerprint contains three things. First of all, you have latent prints that are made out of sweat and oil on the skin surface. And this type of fingerprint is invisible to the naked eye and requires additional processing in order to be seen. You know, they have to dust for fingerprints. And did you know that fingerprints are even more unique than DNA? I don't think you can modify unique, but in this case, they are more unique than DNA. They are, though, less unique than snowflakes, but more unique than our genetic material. Well, visible fingerprints are made on a type of surface that creates an impression, like blood, dirt, or clay. Oftentimes, you'll see in a very bloody scene, bloody fingerprints. Those are very easy to collect. Now, latent prints are made when the sweat, oil, and other substances on the skin reproduce the ridge structure of your fingerprints on a glass, murder weapon, or any other surface that the perpetrator has touched. Now, these prints cannot be seen with the naked eye, but they can be made visible using a dark powder, lasers, or other light sources. And in some cases, they use super glue and heat it up and it attaches to the oil in the fingerprint. And you can lift the prints with tape or take special photographs of them. So how long have humans been using fingerprints as a basic form of identification? Well, did you know the Babylonians and the ancient Chinese used fingerprints? There are actual records of fingerprints being taken many centuries ago, but they're not, of course, nearly as sophisticated as today. The ancient Babylonians pressed their fingertips into clay to record business transactions, and the Chinese used ink on paper finger impressions for business and to help identify their children. You know, when you're a baby, they take a footprint and stick it on your birth certificate. However, fingerprints were not used as a method for identifying a criminal until the 19th century. In 1858, an Englishman named Sir William Herschel was working as a chief magistrate. In order to reduce fraud, he had the residents record their fingerprints when signing business documents. The technique of fingerprinting is known as dactyloscopy. Until the advent of the digital scanning technologies, fingerprinting was done using ink, in a card. It's very rudimentary. In fact, there was one detective who had a cold case and he, there was no unified APHIS fingerprint database at the time. So he had to print up hundreds of the same fingerprint card and mail it out to hundreds of different police precincts and departments around the country. And he eventually got a match, but wow, it took a lot of time. And just a little side note, you know, you've got dactyloscopy is the fingerprinting process, but there's something also called polydactyly. That's a rare condition that some people are born with. In fact, Kentucky Wildcats linebacker J.J. Weaver has a sixth finger on his right hand. That's polydactyly. Sounds like a name, doesn't it? I'm polydactyly. So how many people does this affect, you ask? Well, about one in 500 people in the United States are affected by polydactyly, and it affects both males and females at the same rate. So if you have polydactyly and you're listening to my podcast, put your finger in the air. Thank you. But then you've got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers player, Jason Pierre-Paul, who blew off his right index finger and the top of his middle finger during a fireworks accident here in South Florida. And he has actually been able to play in the NFL despite losing the fingers. And I think Anne Boleyn also had a sixth finger. You know, Henry VIII's, I think, third wife. (laughs) He still cut her head off. So you've got some people with extra fingers and some people with less than 10 fingers. 
it still works. And in the case of the NFL, those players wear special gloves. So look at your fingertips. Can you see your own fingerprints? We all have them and everyone is unique, as I said, even in identical twins. You have a probability though, there is a one in 64 billion chance that your fingerprint will match up exactly with someone else's. So there is a chance. And there are certain patterns that fingerprints display. The fingerprints are divided into three basic types. And then there's one type that has a couple of different categories. And the three basic types of fingerprints are whirl, loop, and arch. The arch is further broken up into a plain arch and a tented arch. So the arch is like, it's like a line that goes from one side of your finger to the other. It doesn't whirl around in like a, a circular pattern. So Rebecca Hooks is a crime scene investigator and she explains one type of fingerprint whirl. A double loop whirl has two loops combined into one print. It resembles a yin yang symbol with two teardrop shaped halves. And if a print has two or more patterns or does not fall clearly into any other category, it is considered an accidental whirl. Which ice skaters in the upcoming Olympics will try to avoid after their triple toe loop or quadruple axle. I think you lose five points for an accidental whirl. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's believed that Harry Jackson, born in 1861, was the first man to be convicted in the United Kingdom using fingerprint evidence. In June of 1902, a burglary occurred in a house in Denmark Hill, London, and some billiard balls were stolen. Apparently, his fingerprints were found in the cue stick chalk. No, I just made that up. Anyway, DNA is still the gold standard as far as direct evidence that ties a suspect to a crime, but fingerprint analysis can be subjective. I mean, it depends on who's doing the comparison. DNA is not subjective. I mean, you can have a six-point match, an eight-point match, a 12-point match. It depends. I mean, personally, if I'm going to be busted by a fingerprint, I'd prefer a 100% match. But that's not possible with fingerprints. And in 1901, Scotland Yard established its first fingerprint bureau. Following year, the prints were presented as evidence for the first time in the English courts. And in 1903, New York State prisons adopted the use of fingerprints, followed later by the FBI. And I brought this up earlier. APHIS is the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. It's actually enabled law enforcement officials around the world to cross-check a print with millions of fingerprint records almost simultaneously or instantaneously, which obviously is a lot faster than having to copy a fingerprint card and mail it out to every precinct in the country or, or even around the world. APHIS collects digital fingerprints with sensors. Computer software then looks for patterns and minutia points. And this is based on the Sir Edward Henry system. So it's the Henry system to find the best match in its database. But everything changed in 1999 with the introduction of integrated APHIS. Its system is maintained by the FBI's Criminal Justice Services Division. And it can categorize, search, and retrieve fingerprints from virtually anywhere in the country in as little as 30 minutes. And it also includes mug shots, criminal histories on some 47 million people i APHIS allows local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies to access the same huge database of information. The i APHIS system operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So in this case in Delray Beach, I, by the way, just moved to Delray Beach. I love it. But um, it's just south of West Palm Beach, so I didn't move very far. But police found the body of a Pompano Beach resident, 21-year-old Carla Lowe, lying in the street near an Amtrak station, November 13, 1983. An investigator said a new fingerprint technology led them to their suspect, 59-year-old Ralph Williams. He was always a person of interest, but they never had any direct evidence to charge him with her murder. He was arrested just last week in Jacksonville and charged with Carla Lowe's death. Now, detectives say they searched the area for hours, never found anybody who saw or heard anything suspicious. So you don't have any eyewitnesses, which aren't the most reliable. And on the same day her body was found, Delray Beach police arrested Williams on grand theft auto and burglary charges, according to records, but they weren't able to get him for the murder. There was no apparent connection between Lowe and Williams and no motive for the murder. So Detective Todd Clancy was the leader of the Delray Beaches Cold Case Unit who cracked this case. 
And Clancy says through the years, there's never been enough evidence for probable cause to arrest Williams in connection with Carla Lowe's death. But this new technology from the company based in the United Kingdom later allowed him to identify Williams' fingerprint on a piece of evidence at the scene. He didn't explain what the evidence was. By the way, Williams' criminal record shows more than 20 arrests across Florida on charges that include burglary, resisting an officer with violence, robbery with a gun or deadly weapon, selling, manufacturing, or delivering heroin and marijuana, and possession of burglary tools. So it's safe to say that his fingerprints were in the system. So what is this new technology developed in the United Kingdom? The UK Defense Minister, Harriet Baldwin, recently unveiled the Advanced Fingerprint Visualization Technology to target criminals. And the new technology makes use of an innovative chemical to recover fingerprints from services that are challenging. It also recovers fingerprints from items exposed to high temperatures, including IED components and fired ammunition cases in a war zone, in addition to metal items that have been deliberately cleaned, such as knives. So I must admit, I don't know what kind of chemical they're using in the UK, but here in the United States, Eddie Murphy and Beverly Hills Cop use super glue in order to get a fingerprint off a matchbook in a turtle tank. Give me that super glue. Okay. Weird, huh? It's not weird. It's very simple. What happens is the fumes from the super glue attaches itself to the acid from the fingerprints. See? This old street cop trick hasn't filtered down to you boys down in Beverly Hills yet, though. Now all we have to do is match it. Anyway, although the technology needs further refinement, it will be of significant benefit to forensic scientists across the world, especially Inspector Clouseau in France. A beekeeper who has lost his voice, a cook who thinks he's a gardener, and a witness to murder. Oh yes, it is obvious to my trained eye that there is much more going on here than meets the ear. Priceless Steinway. Not anymore. Now, Delray Beach Police did not say where they lifted the print from that they ended up nabbing the suspect Williams with, but they apparently got a match. And Williams, a former South Florida resident now living in Jacksonville, was taken into custody with the assistance of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. But I wanted to tell you the United States has new fingerprint technology, too. For example, in New York, though, Westchester County Police vacuum metal disposition technology is available. It allows them to lift prints from things that you couldn't lift a print from in the past. These items include fired ammunition, plastic bags, thermal paper, money, wood, and articles of clothing. The process exposes fingerprints that otherwise would have gone undetected or have been impossible to lift using traditional means. They can also lift prints from items found underwater or exposed to fire. The VMD device can also be used to reprocess evidence in cold cases dating back more than two decades like this one. What about people who try to remove their fingerprints? They're not wearing gloves, but they've tried to remove their fingerprints. This year, there's a new subsurface fingerprint biometric system that was unveiled by a company called Bitflow, and it reportedly can identify individuals from skin layers beneath their finger surface. It's sort of like the technology that allows investigators to lift a serial number off a gun that a criminal thought he or she had ground off. Well, it's the same idea. It's called Frame Grabber, and the new system is designed to identify suspects who've burned or otherwise rendered their fingerprints unrecognizable by traditional biometric recognition systems. That way you don't have to remember what you touched at a crime scene. It makes it a lot easier for criminals. Or so they thought. The full-filled optical coherence tomography system can analyze the collection of skin layers beneath the finger surface, commonly referred to as viable epidermis or internal fingerprint, which can have the same topography as your finger surface. So today, the actual act of fingerprinting, law enforcement taking your fingerprints after you've allegedly committed a crime, is completely different than rolling your fingers over a big pad of ink and rolling it back on a piece of paper. There's something called print scan, and it's been authorized to transmit fingerprints to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The live scan printer has been approved by the FDLE. Here's Detective Tim O'Leary explaining live scan scan fingerprinting. So we're here at our live scan fingerprint position Mm -hmm. uh, where we actually take fingerprints from people that we've taken into custody. In the past we never did it this way. We actually took fingerprints with ink. 
Uh, we still do sometimes, but we take fingerprints with ink, we actually put ink on the fingerprints, and we put them on uh, cardstock. Once we fingerprint somebody that's been arrested, we send those fingerprints to the state and to the F uh, FBI, where mm -hmm. they compare them with their fingerprint database. Now, in the past, we would have to wait months in order to find out whether someone gave us false information. If someone was arrested and they gave us false information, wrong name, wrong date of birth, and we fingerprinted them, we wouldn't know until months later that they had been arrested before they were someone else. Now with our live scan system, we actually fingerprint them here, and the fingerprints are electronically sent to both the state and the FBI. And we'll get a result, or what we call a hit, back sometimes as quick as 10 minutes. That's fast. And DNA testing has also sped up as well. It used to take weeks, if not months, to get results back, now much quicker. And also with DNA, you've got touch DNA, where they can get a DNA sample from just wherever you your fingerprints touched. So we are really advancing quite rapidly in terms of being able to determine who was at the scene of a crime and who committed it. Now, I wanted to end with a little vignette about my life when I was a kid we had just moved into a new home in Saginaw Michigan and we came home I was with my mom and dad my sister was spending the night somewhere else and when we came home my dad says to my mom did they have to move the furniture the stereo to put up the new drapes because we just moved in and she's like no and he goes oh my god we've been robbed my suits my suits and he runs upstairs to check his suits and mom and I are standing in the foyer going what is going on maybe they're still in the house and then he goes my guns my guns and he runs down to the basement <laughs> where the dog was and he checked that out then he goes okay let's see what's been stolen so we called the sheriff and the sheriff comes over and he, after everything is all said and done, the sheriff then takes a pencil and sticks it through the loop on the tail of my piggy bank. I had a little metal piggy bank that had like a screw that held it together. It came apart in the middle and he dusted the piggy bank for fingerprints. And guess whose fingerprints were on the piggy bank? It wasn't the robbers, the burglars. It was me, my fingerprints and my dad. Dad's fingerprints. Aha! We've got the culprits. No. So after everyone had left, we were all terrified. And my mom is like, Don, that's my dad's name, he had a shotgun next to the bed and he had the shells all the way across the room on the dresser. She's like, if someone gets in here, you're going to run across the room, get the shells, and then load the gun. And then he just says, oh, yeah, you're right. And he gets up and he walks into the bathroom and he quickly yanks the bathtub curtain to the right. To see if anyone was in there. Oh my God. <laughs> it was very scary. It's very unsettling when someone's in your home and robs you. They even found the little piggy bank that we had in the back of our pantry. Uh, you know, it just had quarters in it for our school, our lunch money. They were very thorough. It was very, very unnerving to be robbed. And I'm sorry, burgled. Burglary means that someone illegally entered your property and stole your stuff and robbery means that they stole your stuff from your person using force or a weapon i just wanted to let you know that back then they did fingerprint and check out who was in the house and it turned out to be my dad and myself so end of story you know i'm looking at my fingerprints right now i've got the simple whirl not the tilt whirl the simple whirl and i also inspected ted bundy's fingerprints you know he was nabbed by the way by a bite mark he bit the breast or buttocks of one of his victims. He has a simple world too. But, you know, the mind reels. I have a photo of his prints on Instagram, on my Full Rigger Podcast Instagram page, and also at 850WFTL.com under Karen's Crime Blog. I also have a photo of the beautiful murder victim from Delray Beach, Carla Lowe, whose cold case was just solved using the latest in fingerprint analysis. Well, that wraps up this episode of Full Rigor. I hope you learned something. I sure did. Wear gloves the next time you commit a crime. <laughs> Make sure you give me five stars, download, and subscribe to Full Rigor. We'll have another episode next week. Until next time, thanks for joining me.